Right, so I hope, well, I can see the pieces have been ravaged as well. Yes. <laughs> um, so I hope you all enjoyed them, even if they were a bit cold. Um, so next up, we've got Phil Hawksworth. Um, Phil's a principal developer advocate at Netlify. Um, if you don't use Netlify, use Netlify, it's fantastic. The Least Yes website is hosted on Netlify, and I've automated the crap out of it. Um, so I've followed Phil since 2014, when Ooh. I saw him uh, at Wuthering Bikes in Hebden Bridge. Um, Phil didn't work for Netlify then, he worked for an agency called RGA. That's right, yeah. Um, but his talk was fantastic, and he said a lot of great things. I can't remember what the talk, I'm sure the talk was about static stuff. It was stuff. basically the same it was thing. Big. Phil talks about the same thing for years. Um, and yeah, I was also lucky enough to speak at the same conference as Phil uh, earlier this month. Um, and I wanted to get Phil to come here for a while. Um, I've just never reached out to him because I figured he goes to a lot of conferences and speaks a lot. And we try and book like three months in advance because people drop out. Um, and I figured that wouldn't fit in well. But when Phil messaged us, I was super excited. Um, so yeah, it, it's great to have Phil here. Um, and he's going to be talking about the service web. So thank you very much, Thanks, Phil. Luke. Awesome. Well, 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 your introduction. That's very, that's very kind of you. Um, uh, well, well, where to begin? I mean, first of all, thanks for having me, and thank you for sticking around after the pizza as well. We've had two great talks and pizza. I thought that might have been an exodus, so I'm very grateful that you all stuck around. So that's, that's lovely. Um, I'm really conscious of, of time. Uh, I don't like uh, running over time uh, for a talk, so I'm kind of nervously kind of progressing with this. I even went to the trouble, now I've got a timer on here, I've got a timer on my watch because you know there's pubs to go to and what have you. Uh, so yeah, I invested in a watch that would kind of rattle on my wrist when I get close to time. Um, I love this thing, it's great, it has one of these, this lovely kind of wireless charger which I use all the time. I'm all in on wireless charging now. I've uh, you know, got one of, I actually don't have this one, this is a wireless charger for iPhones, Androids have them now, I have this one. It's a little bit different. I've got one next to my bed, next to my uh, next to my desk, so I always pop it in there. Um, of course, both of these things have this, uh, which the eagle-eyed amongst you will have spotted already. And don't be fooled by this particular picture either. I mean, they've got a fairly aggressive crop on there, but we know there's stuff going on. <laughs> <laughs> we know there are wires here. Um, I went down a bit of a rabbit hole when I started looking for, for wireless charges, and I found this. I don't know what's happening here, but this is a wireless charging pad that you can put a wireless charger on with a wire that, I, I don't know, it's, uh, you get the point. I don't need to labor the point too much. Um, we talk about wireless a lot, we kind of accept what it means, uh, but when it comes to serverless, uh, there's, I'm always nervous about saying something about serverless because someone in the room will go, oh, I think you'll find, as Tom kind of mentioned earlier on, there is a server. But just someone's desktop. Just someone's, yeah, it's someone else's machine, it's someone else's computer, and that's the thing. I don't want to have to deal with it. I want to kind of focus on the things that I care about. You know, it's great to work on a project where you don't have to worry about the servers and that kind of infrastructure. It lets you focus on the things that you, you have to care about when you're building something. Um, I kind of actually think it's better to put it like this. It's kind of, you're actually liberated to, to focus on the things that matter. You know, Tom mentioned all of the stuff that you have to do to, to build that kind of coffee finder app. And you know, he could focus on the right things there. And I think that's a really big, big deal. Um, I used to work at an agency building various kind of projects for big brands and big clients. And those big projects are a pain. There's lots of problems with big projects like that. Um, they're full of constraints and complexity and infrastructure. And there's a lot of stuff to kind of have to deal with. So I feel really liberated if I can find a way of building things where I don't have to, you know, also worry mm -hmm. about that kind of infrastructure. So. As you know, people who maybe are building things with JavaScript or front-end developers or web developers, maybe we don't always have to reach all the way back into the infrastructure. We've kind of already heard a little bit about that before. Um, Chris Coyer gave a, a talk recently, um, a really nice talk called Oops, I Guess We're All Full-Stack full Developers Now, uh, which is a snappy title, I love it. Uh, and uh, um, in that, he had this slide which kind of talked about you know, the spectrum of things that we might need to know about when we're working on on projects for the web. And a big part of that, you know, being in the infrastructure and kind of this kind of lamp stack as a traditional stack that's very, very common, you know, with the skills over here, but then you know often we're we're working at, with a slightly different skills, set of skills. 
And it's nice to be able to use those exact skills to be able to do all kinds of projects without needing to worry about this kind of stuff. So I'll, I'll touch on that in a little bit. But my motivation for that kind of thing is because I really like lines and boxes. You know, I like doodling flows and logic and, and you know, thinking about how, how are things going to work um, without having to decompose those down to, well, how am I going to do all of the infrastructure and the kind of the low level stuff. Um, we'll come back to this in a little while. Um, as Luke already, where he says, uh, my name is Phil Hawksworth, my pronouns are he, him. Uh, I work in developer experience at Netlify. I know we don't do Q&A here, but I'll be around afterwards for Q&A. And if you want to ask a question later, when it occurs to you, you can ask me on Twitter. I'm at Phil Hawksworth on Twitter, or if people are on the live stream or watching the video, very happy to answer questions. Um, I wrote uh, a book with uh, the founder of Netlify, Matthias Billman, um, recently, and uh, you can get that for free, imagine, uh, as, a, as a download. Find that at Jamstack book. Uh, but then when I, I, I brought a couple of, you know, a few of the paper ones here as well, when Luke badged them up as prizes, I thought, well, that's, that's odd because they're available for free. Uh, so I thought, well, maybe some stars will make that <laughs> exciting or, you know, a genuine paper thing uh, is what you could have. Um, so I don't want to kind of cannibalize the, the, the drawer at the end. Um, but yeah, there are a few here, but you can also get them from that. I'll share this URL later on. Um, this this find that dot at um, shortener, I'll use it in a bunch of places throughout the talk. Um, so all of these slides are available now, uh, find that at servered. Um, uh, and in fact, if you just go to find that at, you'll read an article about how I made that shortener using some of the tools that we'll talk about here as well. So it's going to get very meta. Who knows where we're going to end up? But this is what we're, what I was saying I was going to talk about. Are you being served exploring the serverless web? And some of you may remember this. Are you being served? Do people remember this program? <laughs> I, I love the way that the hands go up. People are like, yeah, I remember it. <laughs> yes, it's, uh, it was a terrible thing. Um, uh, and when I was... When I was looking around uh, for pictures to put on here of this, I was alarmed to discover you could get this on DVD. I thought it was gone a long time before DVDs came along. There's even a movie of it. The movie poster tells you, I think, pretty much everything you need to know about this genre of, of content. Um, the reason it existed, I think, was because of the 70s. Uh, taste wasn't always the best thing there. Um, thanks a bunch to the 70s for that. We made bad decisions in the 70s. This, for instance, is what I look like in the 70s. Uh, yeah, enough said about that. Uh, but that's not what we're, we're here to talk about. When, what we're here to talk about is kind of serverless and a serverless web. When I talk about serverless, what I'm really referring to is functions as a service, um, which I think is a slightly more descriptive way of talking about this particular part of serverless. Um, but I also mentioned this, like serving websites without service, and I'm excited about that. And you might well kind of raise an eyebrow when I put something like that on the screen, but I'll refer you back to this diagram <laughs> from earlier on. Um, because what I'm really thinking about is hosting servers, delivering ser ser sorry, websites, delivering websites without me having to ever worry about a server. And that's a real kind of attribute of this thing that I kind of talk about quite a lot, like the Jamstack. And I know there's been a few talks about Jamstack over the last you know, few months uh, here, so I won't, I won't labor on this too much, but just very briefly, you know, Jamstack stands for JavaScript APIs and markup. And you might well ask, do we really need another stack? We've got lots and lots of stacks. Um, and really, that's, that's, a fair, that's a fair question. Um, so let me unpack it a tiny bit more and say why this is a thing that exists. So the definition that you know, we're trying to, trying to kind of um, help people to understand the Jamstack is this. It's a modern architecture, create fast and secure sites and dynamic apps with JavaScript, APIs, and pre-rendered markup served without web servers. And this is kind of a, a key part of it, serving without <coughs> web servers. This isn't necessarily a new thing. In fact, you know, this, this phrase, babe don't fry, was popularized by Aaron Swartz a long time ago. Um, Aaron wrote on his, his blog uh, in, a, in a post about this called Babe Don't Fry. Um, he said, you know, I care about not having to maintain cranky AOL server Postgres and Oracle installs. 2002 that was. So this is not necessarily a new thing, pre-rendering sites, getting static assets and serving them directly from something that could be simpler. This has been around a long time, but what I think is interesting is the enablers that have allowed us to do a bit more with this. So the tooling and the ecosystem around it, of which you know the company I, where I work, Netlify, is, is a part, 
I think that's what's changing, and that's what's making what could be considered kind of kind of mundane or kind of dusty. This notion of having static assets it elevates it to something exciting. I think so. Now, what even can a static site be? Well, you know, there's lots of obvious contenders for this. So things like this. So this is React has already got to mention tonight. Here's another one. You know, the React site is is a pre-rendered site hosted on Netlify, five. It could doesn't matter. It could be anywhere. Likewise, the Yarn. That's a pre-generated static Jamstack site. View.org. That's another kind of contender for that. Leaves.js. Got to mention already. Uh, as Luke said, he's automated the hell out of this. I know that you generate all kinds of things, including <laughs> like the, the frame I guess I'm now standing in in the live stream yep. is pre-rendered from, from assets of this site. Um, so there's all kinds of interesting stuff you can do with it, but you know, can it get to be a little bit more dynamic? Well, this is a, an example that I kind of trot out quite often. Um, do people know Smashing Magazine in the room? Most people, most people know this resource. Um, so this is a pre-generated static site. Uh, a Jamstack site that has all kinds of capabilities like membership and commenting and commerce and <coughs> all kinds of things. It's not traditionally something you'd think of as static. This is a Jamstack site. Um, this site, my own, my own blog, whew, uh, a lofty example. Um, this is just a blog, uh, but this is starting to get a tiny bit more dynamic. But goodness, that's bright on the screen. Um, it's a blog with blog posts, and I've got like a search that happens in line. Um, Nothing, you know, particularly, it's getting a bit meta because the search is linking to a blog post about the search. Um, and then on the home page, I've got things that I recently tweeted, including a tweet from earlier on today about coming here. I haven't redeployed this site or done anything like that since, <coughs> since I tweeted that, and I'm not pulling things in in JavaScript in the front end. It kind of redeployed itself because I used something uh, in the, the tooling that provides it, um, a build hook. So, here is a view of my kind of admin for my site, which is where my site build runs. Uh, and there's a few hooks, so you can't quite see this at the back, but there's a Twitter activity trigger. So an HTTP endpoint that if ever I post to that, it will rebuild the site. I can create as many of those as I like. So I've got one for Twitter activity. I've got if this, then that, watching my Twitter feed. If I ever tweet, it goes, oh, trigger build, please. You also notice I have another one down here, Alexa voice command. Didn't want to be out, out uh, gunned by Luke, who's automated the crap out of everything in his house. I wanted to be able to say, deploy hawksworks.com while standing in my, uh, in my, in my bedroom. Uh, the arms are important. If I'm <laughs> um, so anyway, there's, there's all kinds of automation that can make things feel a bit more dynamic. Talked about this kind of variously on Twitter. So I did this for a while, and I shouted about this on Twitter. I got a bit cocky. Uh, so people on the internet noticed. Uh, which is alarming. Uh, and then I saw this tweet. So Zach Leatherman, uh, you might know from Static Site Differences like at 11T or from his great work on, on web form performance. Um, he, he tweeted this, free site project idea, an HTML only, st HTML only static site generated clock that deploys a new version to Netlify every minute. Um, so I think he was poking fun at me a little bit because I always go on about how easy it is to do. Um, so I looked at this and I thought for a while, and then I thought, well, <laughs> let's have a look. But after a while, you know, thinking about how, if this is really possible, I had to tweet this, you know, uh, back at Zach saying, only an idiot would make what you're suggesting. Here it is. Uh, <laughs> so, so you can go to set your watch by netlify.com. And if you're, I, people have phones in their hands, which is alarming. Um, uh, if you want to go to it, you can go find, find that at the time. There are easier ways to get the time, but that's fine. Um, and that takes you to this site. And what that is, it's a site that shows the time that the site was rendered. That's all it, ha all it does. There's a few other bits and pieces that happen, and I actually do it in a few different locales and uh, time zones so that we can route people to the right page. But it's ultimately, it's 24 pages you know, for different time zones, um, and they just show the time that the server rendered the, the page. Um, that's kind of it. Uh, the way I trigger that to happen every minute of the day um, is I use something called webtask.io, which is somewhere that just will uh, manage your serverless functions for you. So I have a little serverless function. You won't be able to see at the back, but that's okay, because all it does is an HTTP post to one of those build triggers that build the site. It does it every minute of the day, and so, and so far it's done it 455,000 times uh, since I deployed the site, uh, which is why the next slide is this. 
because of course that's a ridiculous example. That's not the way to deploy a site. But the point I'm trying to make is that the friction in deploying a site has gone through the floor. The cost in deploying a site is kind of approaching zero. So I can do this in such a way that it's, it just, it just it, it works. Uh, so you can make what might be thought of a static site much more dynamic. A silly example. So, oh, I'm way over time. I need to go faster. <laughs> so I kind of want to talk about a few different aspects then of, of, of Jamstack. And I'm going to show an example. So there's pre-rendering I want to talk about, which you touched on, and serverless on demand, which is the serverless part of this talk. So pre-rendering. Um, I want to mention some motives for, for pre-rendering. Well, I think of it as doing the work now so that you don't have to have your servers do it later. You don't have to have it happen at request time. I like the idea of generating the site, generating the views of the site long before your users come to it to, to request it. It puts some distance between the complexity and the user. So if something goes wrong, it happens in an environment that has no impact on the user whatsoever. So, I'm just going to describe a couple of different scenarios, right, just to illustrate the, the difference. So we'll have a traditional kind of stack, a flow, and then we'll look at static. So a traditional view might be uh, a, a browser makes a request for a site. Maybe it hits a CDN. More likely, it's actually going to go to a load balancer, uh, which might have to decide which of a number of servers is going to service this request, which you know, we'll have to say, OK, I've got a template. I need to get some data populate that template, I'll hit my database server, uh, figure out which is the right one, pass the data back, assemble the view, pass it back to the load balancer, go maybe uh, stash some things in the CDN, uh, return something to the, the, the user, and then it's in the eyeballs of the user. Very, very generic, not very specific uh, kind of illustration of a, of a flow there. And on the Jamstack site, it's slightly different because what happens is the user makes a request, that goes to a CDN, the CDN has the view already and returns it and we're done. Everything is hosted directly at the CDN. And that's the, the big kind of difference here. The complexity is, is quite, quite different. Now, if we kind of look at what that means, it means that deploying a site and making changes to a site doesn't have to touch all of these other parts of infrastructure. It's all about getting the content to the CDN. So the deployment becomes running a build, it's the same build that you might run locally on your local machine when you're doing development and pushing that to a CDN. And that's, that's this lovely kind of separation. The moving parts are happening at build time. They're not happening at request time. And that's got a bunch of advantages. Very quickly, there's things like security, performance, and scale. I'll touch very quickly on each one of them. First, so for security, as you might imagine, we've got a greatly reduced surface area there. We kind of go back to this diagram. There's lots of infrastructure here where a request could touch, but you know, some, we, we have to make sure these things are all secure. All of these things have to be buttoned up and safe. Um, of course, if you remove them, there's nothing safer, safer than a server that doesn't exist. Uh, so the infrastructure is quite different. Um, there's far fewer moving parts to attack is the kind of the key. When it comes to performance, well, a traditional stack will try and add static layers very often to improve performance under load. So that's, I'm talking really about caching. So what happens again, back to our diagram, you know, we'll start to see kind of adding layers of caching to try and alleviate some of that load, effectively statically rendering some of these things already and having them ready to go. That extends right the way to the database service for expensive queries across the load balancer. The CDN is a big cache. Now, if some of the things are cached and some of them are not, then you have to manage things in and out of the cache. And that's something that I will 100% of the time mess up. Uh, so I like the idea of everything being served from the cache, and I don't have to worry about the logic across that. Let's touch on scale very quickly. You know, traditional mm -hmm. stacks will start to add infrastructure to it in order to scale under load. So again, kind of caching has already solved some of that potentially for us. But then when we're thinking about how do we serve giant volumes of traffic, often what I would do when I was uh, working in as, as a technical architect is I would say, well, we need to add more infrastructure. We need to figure out how we need to add servers to this. So you start adding servers, adding database servers, adding more load balancers, there's more stuff. When you can decouple these things, you end up with a situation where everything is served from a CDN, the, the load happens, the, uh, sorry, the deployment happens, the logic is happening at build time. So this decoupling means that we can concentrate on just getting things to the CDN. And there's lots of tools now that help us get to the CDN more effectively. So we've already heard a little bit today already about AWS, but Azure and Cloud, uh, Google Cloud 
have products for this. You might have encountered something called Surge as well, which is a tool to try to help you automate a build, get it to a CDN. Uh, Zeit is another one, and Netlify, uh, where I am. Okay, I'm going rather fast because I want to get to a quick demo. Um, so we talked about pre-rendering, but what about serverless on demand? Well, this is kind of an interesting one because serverless seems to fit nicely into Jamstack because Surge without web servers is what we're talking about. Um, and you know, I think of serverless as a nice complement really to Jamstack. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about why that is. Serverless is often really valuable because having a function as a service means that you know, on these occasions when we absolutely need some logic on a server, we can, we can call on serverless functions to do that for us without having to provision lots of infrastructure as well. So there's a temptation to say, well, all of the things we used to do on a server, let's just do all of that in serverless functions. And I'm just urging a tiny bit of caution there because this other part of talking about Jamstack was this piece, you know, pre-rendered markup. Um, and I think pre-rendering as much as possible is really key. So that's why I think of serverless sometimes as a nice escape hatch or a nice complement to Jamstack. But I wouldn't try and just recreate all of my server logic for every site that I would normally do right in the service. In some cases, I mean, every scenario is slightly different. But I like the idea of uh, being able to free myself from managing the infrastructure, but also free myself from having to think about the dynamic logic that goes on when you've got moving parts as part of your deployment. I think often about augmentation. I think about like enhancing something that's static with one or two dynamic pieces. Um, in fact, this term static first was coined by uh, by a guy called Marcus Shork, who works at Unilever, thinking about these kind of projects. Um, I'm going super fast because I want to show you an example of, of how this kind of stuff can work. So I made a thing. Um, I made this thing called Virtual Lollipop because it needed to exist in the world. Uh, the idea being that you can create a, a lollipop that you'll give to someone so I can create a lollipop, customize it, address it to Luke, say thanks for letting me come to Leeds JS, it's ruddy grade, sign it from me. Uh, and it will create a lollipop that's on a, a unique URL that I can then send to Luke, and then his day is glorious uh, because it's, in, it's enlightened by this. So this is user-generated content that I wanted to pre-generate and make static, so how can I do that? Well, a few requirements I've given myself. Uh, first of all, I wanted pre-generated pages with re real URLs, even for things that were user-generated content. I wanted to have data stored somewhere because it's, you know, there's dynamic data going on here. So I wanted a database, but I didn't want to become a DBA uh, to do that. Um, and I wanted to have instant access to the new content. So in other words, uh, as the site is being rebuilt, I want to have instant access to that content anyway. So the tools that I, uh, I, I, made, I used to, to do this were for the pre-generating the, pre the, the pages, I used Eleventy. It could have been any static site generator. It just so happened I used Eleventy. Um, for the data, I used FaunaDB. It could have been anything else. It could have been uh, uh, DynamoDB. It could have been anything else at all. Uh, and for instant access to the new content, I used Netlify functions. So uh, that, again, that could have been any other serverless function provider. But these are the tools that I use for that. So I don't know. You obviously can't read this, but that's OK. I'm going to dig in. Uh, and describe the flow here. So when I make a request viewing a lollipop, uh, that's hitting a set of static assets. So every URL resolves to a, to a lolly page, and it just returns that view. Those have been generated at some point by a request to the database, and the request to the database looks like this at build time. Now again, I know you can't read this code, but that's okay, because what's happening is we're authenticating with the database service, we're querying for all the lollies, and this is going to return a promise. Um, we resolve the promise of the lollies when we find them, and we catch any errors. And I put this up really because I wanted to show you this, this much effort to do that, uh, and also I wanted to be able to put on the slide, resolve the promise of lollies, because <laughs> why don't you want to put that on the slide, you'll in your life. Um, so that's viewing a lolly, we'll generate the site that makes all of these pages exist. Uh, but what about making a lolly? Well, that happens over here. So there's another page, which is the create lolly page. You've seen a snapshot of it. It's a form, effectively. This, is a, this form is served statically. It's just a static page in my site. But when I post the data to that, it doesn't, doesn't have anywhere to go, except it goes to a serverless function, which saves the data. It stashes it in the database, and then it returns the user back to the view of the lolly with the URL that it's just said it's going to create. 
But of course, at this point, it doesn't exist because the site hasn't been regenerated. It hasn't, got, hasn't created a URL for that. So we'll get a 404. That could be a problem, but we can use that to our advantage because the tooling now gives us chances to do things with things like triggers and automation. You've already seen before that I trigger a build for things like my site when things happened and it's just automated. And that's what we'll do here. So I've created a build hook called new lolly in the freezer. Um, <laughs> it's very important to be descriptive. Uh, and there's the URL for that. And, and what happens, uh, happens is, you know, as soon as uh, my save data uh, posts uh, the content to the, uh, to the database, saves that, it also fires that hook. Here's what that looks like. And again, I know you can't read that, but that's fine because we authenticated the database. We post the data. When that post has happened, we fire our, our request to rebuild the site. Then we send the user uh, with a 302 to a new URL to check the freezer for a lolly. Uh, and really, this is the only reason I wanted to show you this slide because there's a lovely thing to put on the slide. But really, what on earth does check the freezer for a lolly mean? Uh, and this is what it means. So we check for a pre-generated page because we have the URL of that page. If it's a 200, because there's a file there, we serve the static page that existed. But if it's just been created, chances are it'll 404. So then we do a rent, we render a dynamic view, and we do that with another serverless function. So now we hop over here because this might not exist. This pre-generated page might not exist, but the view of the lollipop does exist in the database. So we use this serverless function. Uh, to create a view and render it uh, as a fallback. Got five minutes left. Do I dare do this? Scroll it. We can, we can probably do that, I think. Um, I'm going to sit down because I'm nervous. Uh, let's see. So I'm going to pop over to Chrome. I'm going to unmirror so I don't have to type over my shoulder. Hopefully. Yes. Okay. And I will go to virtual lollipop, uh, and I will make a new lollipop. So this is a static page. There's another static page which is the form. Um, I could. Actually, I'm not going to spend time. I'm going to fall down the rabbit hole of making a lolly that you'll like. <laughs> uh, uh, to Leeds, uh, uh, nice tea uh, because it was um, uh, from Phil, and I'll freeze a lolly. So, so what's happened now is it's made that request to the database, it's stashed it, and it sent me to this URL, which is the, the URL for this, this lolly page, but it couldn't find that URL, so instead it redirected me to a different URL. I don't know what this is doing to the live stream. See, is that Zoom? Yeah, no, fine, confident. <laughs> um, so it sent us to a slightly different URL with uh, the, the ID as a there's a variable there that is given as this, um, oh, can I zoom out properly? Oh, yeah. Which is given as this, this view. So immediately I've got a view of the page. Now, if I go over to uh, my Netify um, console where this is all happening uh, and look at my VLolly site, you can see what's happening. There's a build that's happened and it's been triggered by uh, a new lolly in the freezer, I noticed. Uh, let me just prove it. There we go. There is, there's a new lolly in the freezer. Um, and then, uh, don't laugh at my deploy hook names, they're very important. <laughs> uh, uh, and so there we are, the site is now live. So, uh, so now if I was to, to go to this URL, um, oh dear, <laughs> Googling Tom. <laughs> Tom was in my, uh, Tom, you're always in my, my, uh, my clipboard. Uh, so uh, what, was I, what was I trying to go to? Oh yeah, here we are. Um, Copy, there we go, uh, copy paste. So hopefully now, so there we are, that has rendered a static page that's been served from a file and not from a serverless function. So I'm triggering this every time I write something to the database, and I don't know if that's necessarily sensible. Um, maybe it would be wiser, maybe it would be wiser, um, so I jump back to, there we are. Uh, maybe it'd be wiser to do that just once a day or every now and again rather than doing it all the time. We don't need to thrash the build. But you can see that you can combine statically pre-generating the site and serving something on demand. So this has been enabled by a few things. One of them is this custom 404 routing. 
So on lots of different systems, you could do something to this, something similar to this, but on Netlify, this is what we have. Um, so I'll, I'll just describe this if it's hard to read at the back. So <coughs> for different routes in our site, we can define different 404 behavior. So for everything that's a, a real 404, a server 404 page, but for everything on the lolly path, um, which again is very gratifying to say, everything on the lolly path, uh, which is a 404, will redirect to this service function to do the, the, um, the lookup in the database. If that fails, we'll send you to the other real 404 page so you get a new 404. Now things like these kind of events and triggers and automation really bring this stuff to life. It means pre-generating a site can actually feel much more dynamic now with these kind of tooling. Um, functions as a service, of course, are a big part of that. Uh, being able to, again, do things a bit more dynamically without having to provision an entire server. On two pages of a screen like this, I showed you all the code that I run as a server because it's just running it as a service. Databases as a service is huge for me. As someone who just dabbled a little bit in MySQL, in, uh, MySQL but never wanted to maintain the database server and scale that properly, um, it's I love being able to just get the, the expertise of a team who make their money from doing that properly. So these two things together, I think, can be really interesting and do a lot of things for us. I think there's a bit of a shift happening, and I think it's a really healthy shift, and I'd encourage people to, to look at things a little bit differently. Um, often I see people like, trying to architect a system and say, well, they're going to seek, they're not going to do a static site, but they'll seek opportunity to make some things static as optimizations. No, it's a dynamic site by default, but what can we take and make static to speed things up? I do it the other way around. I flip it completely. I treat things static by default, static first. Things have, for me, have to justify why they need to be dynamic before I'll start to add that layer. And it's amazing how many things actually can, can live kind of as a static or a pre-generated Jamstack site first. You know, can do away with, it, with some of these things for a lot of the sites that we work on uh, and get to this kind of infrastructure. So this is a really nice way to simplify, and I think simplifying is super valuable. Simplify isn't dumbing down. Simplifying is kind of um, letting us focus on what's really important. So I think simplifying gives us a chance to make it easier to reason about the, the logic and the, the infrastructure that it really does exist in our sites, and makes, us, makes it easier for us to build interesting things. So with that, my question is, what should we make? Um, I, my alarm is going off. Uh, I need to recharge and find somewhere to plug in my wireless uh, docking station. Um, I mentioned there were links uh, throughout the talk, and there's a bunch of resources uh, here. There's a lot of them. Um, <coughs> as I mentioned, the slides are at find that dot at servered. Um, with that, I'm a minute over, so apologies for that. Thanks ever so much for, for listening. <laughs> Phil, um, that second time through was just as enjoyable. Um, so, found a bug with the prize draw system. Um, it wasn't in the in the node code that I wrote. It was in the stack site. Um, two tick boxes have the same number. Um, so, if you've entered for a prize, you've just entered the the, the jet brains one. So, what I'm going to do is. Tom really wanted one of these books, and I thought his talk was fantastic, so I'm going to keep one back for him. The first two people to come and see me afterwards can grab a book. Uh, and besides that, we will run the uh, the form for, where has it gone? I've lost the tab. This is my really excellent redesigns. <laughs> um, if I click on winners, so you can see where the three book winners were supposed to be. <laughs> But there are no entries because everyone got entered into the, the JetBrains. So, Tom, you won the JetBrains license as well. And, uh, yeah, you, you always win. Um, <laughs> I'll trade it out for a book. Okay. If you want, I may run that one. The other, uh, someone else can come up and claim one of the uh, JetBrains codes then. Besides that, we will be back on the 31st or the 30th, sometime near Halloween. Um, Still need to confirm speakers for that, but all the information will be up on the website as soon as I can get it. Hmm? 25th. 25th? It's on my third day. October. October. September. Wait, September. <laughs> I'm on my <laughs> The 25th, yes. The 25th. Sorry. Just yeah, we'll be back on the 25th. Um, yeah, um, I will get all the details for that confirmed, uh, and it'll be up on the website and information out to you as soon as possible. 
Um, besides that, thank you very much, everyone, for coming. I'm sorry that the prize draw system broke. Um, bug fixes. <laughs> um, yeah, I hope you all enjoyed it. Uh, I will see you next month. Thank you very much.